we're going to take like three academics, academic minutes for people to come and approach us. Uh, in that time, I would just like to welcome everybody to our Zoom meeting. Uh, Hannah and I are welcoming you from Ljubljana branch of SFU uh, Ljubljana. Uh, we're here to start our uh, first lecture in the lecture series of professional fears and practice of psychology. And we're more than happy to tell you that we have a special guest today to introduce you, us to the uh, field of performance psychology, that is uh, Ms. Sara Sakovic. Uh, and more about her, we'll hear throughout our lecture. Um, we're going to have a conversation talking about performance psychology as a field, maybe how everything, uh, how performance psychologists work, maybe who is the um, population that they work with the most. And also, if anybody feels like asking any questions, you're welcome to write them in the chat. I will uh, look at the chat throughout the, our uh, conversation. If, and if there are questions that uh, are um, should be addressed, I will be happy to ask them uh, for our guests and hopefully get some uh, nice answers. Uh, this is kind of the start of our time together. Um, and I think as far as I can see, everybody has joined. We have nobody else waiting. And sorry, if you're ready, we'd be happy to start. Yes, definitely. Okay. Um, so, Hannah, would you be so kind as to tell us who Sarah is and what do we know so far about her? Sarah, warm welcome again. Um... Tonight we're going to talk about you and uh, performance psychology, um, but some formal information about you. You're mostly known for winning an Olympic silver medal for Slovenia in 2008, and you graduated, you graduated from University of California at Berkeley with a degree in psychology, and then later on, Sarah pursued brain research at UC San Diego, exploring neurological mechanisms of resilience in USA Navy SEALs. Marines and Olympic athletes. She then completed her master's degree in performance psychology. Um, Sai is also a published researcher, lecturer, speaker, and author. And she now works with uh, various athletes, businessmen, musicians, and airline pilots, helping them perform optimally in their highly demanding performance environment. She's also involved in, involved in multiple projects from changing the global education systems such as Junior Fellow of World Academy, to advocating anti-doping in sports, uh, WABA ambassador, as well as promoting the combination of mental and physical fitness. She has recently became certified as a practitioner in hypnotherapy. Um, so this was the formal introduction, but now it's <laughs> a long one. But now we, we want you to tell us who Sara really is. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. It's really a pleasure uh, to spend time with you this evening. I really appreciate your time and that um, hopefully I can be a source uh, that you yeah, get uh, some useful information from. Uh, well, yeah, that's uh, <laughs> you listed, um, let's say, really, you know, some of those things that I did in my life. Fortunately, I, I have always done what I loved in life. And it just, you know, spontaneously and naturally, of course, with purposeful intention, but it just, you know, set me on this path where I was able to achieve uh, those little, my, uh, you know, milestones. Um, but um, as Hannah said, I, I love being creative. I love uh, working in my field. So, um, I mean, what else do you need to know about me? Like, I, I am so passionate about sharing my not only experiences of psychology that I acquired as an Olympic athlete in the 20 years um, of my swimming career, but um, of course, all the studies that, that I've been you know, engaged in in the last 14 years, uh, whether it was brain research or performance psychology. Um, my job right now is to kind of merge all that together and then bring to people the most practical tools mental skills um, so that they can be their best, whether in their performance environment or uh, in just you know day-to-day -day functioning. Uh, basically, my job is to make people's life a, a little easier. 
Um, otherwise, now I'm a mom, I have a one and a half year old. So my biggest challenge is practicing all my mental skills and tools on a one and a half year old. That's very energetic. And um, yeah, I live in Slovenia, I moved back. Um, and I love I love that I'm back. But I haven't most of my life, I, I lived abroad. And yeah, some of those years were in the US. I grew up in Dubai, before that in Indonesia, Malaysia. I went to international school most of my life. Um, I'm half Serbian, half Slovenian. Yeah, so if you ask me, Sarah, who are you really? I just feel like an international soul with lots of purpose and passion for what I do. Uh, thank you for this uh, very fun and uh, full uh, introduction. And I couldn't help but notice many times uh, mentioned the word passion. And from what you were saying, I really fed the passion that you have for the field of psychology, uh, what we're also here to talk about. But I would like uh, to ask you, was there any moment throughout your childhood or maybe uh, adolescent years when you decided, I'm going to be a psychologist? Where did this pa uh, passion come from? Could you tell us more about it? When did you decide that this is the path you're going to go? Yeah. So luckily, I understood really the power of my mind because ever since I was 12, and this is really true, like a true fact, ever since I was 12, I, I knew that it's gonna take way more than physical prep preparation to get to the goals that I wanted to achieve. And really ever since I was 12, I was um, committed to mental training. Luckily, I had a, a, we had a, a sports psychologist work with us back then. Everybody made fun of her because in Slovenia, I mean, as much as I love my country, some people are still uh, not so open to, you know, working on the mental aspects, uh, it's quite a taboo topic. Usually people go see a sports psychologist, athletes, uh, when it's too late and something's wrong with them. And uh, luckily, just at that age, I had access to a few meditation recordings. Back then they were called relaxation technique recordings. And um, I was just, uh, you know, because I was so on it, I knew what I wanted. I, I, I engaged in that very early on. So going you know from that year 12 years of age to 20 i had amazing you know skills to to manage my mental drama every single day because people think they're like oh sarah sarah was born so positive and i was like no definitely not <laughs> my mind my mind was as negative as any human on this planet and in the morning in at 5 a.m. when we were you know when we jumped in the water every single day to train on the way to practice, I would, you know, silently pray that my coach would sleep through the alarm. So I wasn't, you know, I wasn't one of those naturally, like, there's no such thing, like gifted, resilient athletes. I was very, I was very um, driven because I knew what I wanted, but I had to train my mind purposefully. So like that experience really helped me then in Berkeley when I got there, say, hey, you know, I love this field of psychology. There's so much uh, potential here. Not a lot of people have the knowledge that I was lucky to obtain through my swimming career. I want to contribute to this field. So in Berkeley, also an, a really good thing about studying in the U.S. is you don't necessarily have to decide immediately what you're going to graduate in. So I took a few psychology courses. I took a, a few biology courses, you know, various different things. And I just fell in love with psychology from, you know, the first class, first semester, and then I remember the second semester, I was walking with my dad on campus and I had to declare my major. And he told me, Sarah, <laughs> this is true story. He told me, Sarah, you're such a good bullshitter. You know, you love people, <laughs> you love to talk. So psychology should be your major. And then the next day I went to enroll into psychology. Wow. Now that you mentioned Berkeley, um, I myself, um graduated from Berkeley too um mm -hmm. with a degree of psychology and go bears bears <laughs> maybe I want to know like what was your reason to go study at Berkeley yeah so it was very similar reason to yours um basically I wanted to continue um, sports and academics at the highest possible level um again in Slovenia what you know if you decide to be 
a student athlete, which means that you continue professionally training while being a student, it's, you know, it's, a li- it's more difficult than in the US. You know, people sometimes think, oh, you went to the US to study because it's easier there. I'm like, no, it's not easier. It's just the way it's structured for me as an athlete to pick classes around my swimming schedule you know, that, that's, that was really a privilege, which means that from 5.30 to 8 in the morning, I had practice, and then I could pick my classes from 8 to 12, um, and then I had practice from 12.30 to 3.30, sometimes 4, and then, and then I could pick, pick my classes again in the afternoon, and I could enroll in those classes before they were full. So it's just a big privilege to be able to combine both swimming and studying at such an elite level. And there was, of course, understanding. And sometimes professors would give me, um, I don't know if you had this, but they would give me midterm exams to go on the road. And I would do midterm exams in hotel rooms if we traveled to competitions. And so basically everything is made around the fact that, you know, people there want you to succeed no matter you know, what you do other, other than studies. So that was really great. Yeah. Opposite to what it's like in Slovenia, right? <laughs> Opposite? <laughs> yeah. We love Slovenia, but we have room for improvement. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree. Uh, would you say that all the, the fact that, that people in the US are like so structured and they want you to succeed and you know, as, as a kid, you have goals, and um, would you say that this kind of led you to decide you wanted to major in psychology? Yeah, well, I mean, I was, in, first of all, yeah, what you said is, you know, very true. People in the U.S. are somehow, I mean, U.S. I don't know if it's the U.S. <laughs> Berkeley is a different little place. <laughs> um, <laughs> but definitely driven people that, um, you know, are there with a purpose and intention. Like they're like, okay, let me get the best out of this experience. Of course, not everybody. I, I had friends, you know, football players that barely went to class. So I would, you know, come to their house and be like, did you study for your exam? And I'm like, no. So I helped them out, you know, so not everyone's like, oh, this is all rainbows and unicorns, but still, um, why I just fell in love with it is because first of all, the professors are so brilliant. They are so brilliant. I remember, I don't know, I just, I sat in class every time, no matter how challenging it was. And one, I don't know why I chose this class, but one semester it was all about circadian rhythms. And I was like, oh my God, I don't understand any of this, but let me try hard and you know, I'm gonna learn all this science. uh, so no matter how challenging it was, the professors were so, so helpful and approachable. And if you remember, they would have office hours and coffee shops. And if you needed help, um, you know, uh, I would go there and ask for help. Um, we had then the smaller discussion sections structured where whatever you learned in class, um, uh, you know, you got, you got to go through again in the discussion sections. And so just the structure of it, you know, this can, you, you cannot fail because you have the midterm exams and the midterm counts this much percent, the next midterm this much percent, uh, the discussion sections, you know, have their own percentage. And then the final, by the time you come to the final exam, you're like, oh, I'm ready. I just have to basically re- review what I did the last few weeks. Um, so the whole, like the, not just, you know, not just, I don't know, I chose psychology because I, I told you I love people, I love helping people. Uh, but just it, all the whole structure of it, I fell in love with and, and the professors that are, oh, I just, I don't know. I wish everyone was in the world was that approachable. Yeah. I agree. Um, so at UC Berkeley, you graduated with, um, from uh, neuroscience and then at UC San Diego, you you kind of like change the field um, to performance psychology. How, how would you describe this transition? So the transition was really like this. Uh, uh, psych- I did psychology major with, with an emphasis on neuropsychology in Berkeley. 
And then when I came to San Diego, I spent a year and a half there, nearly well, a little bit more than that, nearly two years uh, doing brain research. So I went from psychology, emphasis on your psychology to, actual, to an actual job in a lab where I was a research assistant helping out postdoc students and um, Martin, Dr. Martin Paulus is an amazing German um, professor, academic uh, researcher. Um, it was his lab in San, at UCSD, Opti Brain Lab. Um, so what I did was I went from that to brain research and then I moved to performance psychology. Yeah, but you're right. Yeah, so I did change fields like that. Okay. That's an interesting uh, change because working with a bit more biological brain and then working uh, with a performance and the entire athlete or person must be quite a different experience. Yeah, basically I went from doing um, fMRI brain research and putting Navy SEALs and Marines into fMRI and like, you know, sitting behind the computer, giving them tasks, um, different, different mindfulness tasks. We were looking at brain characteristics of resilience um, in the sense that we were looking at what, what characterizes resilience in the brain. Is there a brain structure that helps a human, you know, be better uh, with not only just, you know, coping with stress, but being able better to anticipate stress, manage it and recover from it. Um, so I went from a pure really lab work where then I just did kind of like coding basically um, of translating brain data into I images and then typing, helping type research papers. Yeah, that's exactly why I moved. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I love brain research, but um, not as much as I love working with people um, on site and getting that human experience of, um, really seeing, a, you know, seeing that impact that I can make on someone. I did the brain research because I got crazy amounts like of understanding how the brain works and the passion that I really later developed in my career for mindfulness training came from the research because we, we, we put all the subjects that we worked with, whether Navy SEALs, Marines, Olympic athletes, extreme performers, we put through an eight week mindfulness training course and we were looking at the structural and functional differences in the brain, pre and post mindfulness training. So the brain, everything happens for a reason in life, you know, and as, as all of you can probably relate, one experience just shapes you into better understanding what it is you want to do. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, on the topic of working with people, and if uh, I look back at your previous answer regarding working with sports psychologists uh, when you were a swimmer in Slovenia, uh, I kind of relate to what you said when you mentioned that uh, sports psychologists were a bit uh, of a left laughing stock, a bit left at, uh, because myself, I did um, uh, my bachelor degree uh, in the field of sports psychology. Uh, I uh, researched how stress affects the effectiveness of uh, training of professional acrobats. And I did the research um, in, uh, at the acrobatic group called Dunkin' Devils. And when I came there and started working with all the VO feedback uh, machines and started doing the stress uh, questionnaires, everybody was just laughing, like, what are you doing? Why are you putting all these measurements and asking me how my day was? Uh, but at the end of a uh, three month uh, period, when I got all the results and checked the uh, um, data and told them, oh, look, it actually shows that uh, the more you were uh, stressed, the worse you performed on the training. So it actually has some sort of a meaning behind it. Uh, and you should be wor uh, wary about how your day was and uh, correlate your trainings to that so you can avoid some sort of injuries. Uh, they they kind of went silent and was, uh, were a bit shocked thinking about it, oh, actually, he, he's, he's right. So could you tell me a bit more um, your experience um, of working with sports psychologists in Slovenia and maybe in Dubai and some other countries? You said you, that you were very international. Did you have also international psychologists or? 
I, I, we live in the US. In Dubai, when I lived, I was uh, still a young kid, so I didn't have access uh, yet back then. Uh, in the US, of course, the field is, you know, uh, very, I'm not going to say much, yeah, well, mature, you know, it's, it, it's kind of where it's all originating from and people are engaged in the research and, and you know, finding ways to to be even better performance psychologists, they have more people to work with. So um, it's true exactly, you know, it's exactly true what you said. I feel like that no matter where on the planet you are, um, when you come to a certain level, you understand that it's really the mental aspect that's gonna get you another step higher. And no matter how much you're training, uh, how much physical effort you're putting in time and energy, if you're not training your mind as much as your body, it's really not gonna manifest in the moments that you need to execute your performance. Um, so, uh, well, I didn't, I didn't really ask you your question right now, but uh, I wanted to say that, um, well, I don't know what I want to say. <laughs> what, what did I want to uh, say? What was your question? Uh, I was wondering, uh, how would you describe your experiences uh, uh, working with sports psychologists? Yeah, thank you. Thanks for reminding me. Well, so uh, in Slovenia, I was a young kid. I didn't know any different. Uh, again, back then, they just taught us relaxation techniques. So I, I would, you know, I still had those big, you know, CD holders and I put a CD inside. And before I go to bed, I was, you know, I would breathe and listen to this music. And it was very soothing and nice. I wasn't really sure what I was doing, but I, 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 really believed that it was helping me. So working with this sports psychologist, you know, that's what I learned. And I'm so, so grateful, but I didn't learn much more than that because the later years when people voted whether or not to have a sports psychologist travel with us to European championships, worlds or Olympics, no one raised their hand. And it, you know, it's just unfortunate, but okay. But by then I was kind of like my own mental guru. Um, in the US, it was a more team, team oriented um, aspect of performance psychology, sports psychology, where maybe Hannah, I don't know, maybe your team did this, but um, the woman that worked with us, her, her main uh, goal was to bring us as a team closer together. So she worked a lot more on creating a very strong team culture. And, you know, she would analyze each other's our, our personalities and how we would, um, uh, you know, how my personality would react to stress and how some other personality would react to stress so that we were aware of each other, you know, when we come into challenging situations. Um, so it was more about, it was kind of like that business corporate psychology, but sports-like, um, bringing a team together, developing a common mindset, developing a goal setting strategy where we were all on the same track, we knew what our goals were and developing those little roles, you know, kind of like, what is my role on the team? Um, how are we staying committed, uh, motivated, things like that. So that was another, it was a, just a very different kind of uh, um, approach. I, I work completely differently. <laughs> I must say you were very lucky. Because I only got the experience uh, to work with a psychologist once, I think, or maybe twice. But then we didn't stick with it. I don't know why, but I, I, I agree that it would be useful. Um, but now that you're a performance psychologist, what would you say is a difference between a sports psychology or maybe a performance psychology and coaching psychology, if there is one? Yeah, well... I mean, you know, coaching psychology can be, a lot of people are now into coaching and there's different kinds like, you know, neuro-linguistic programming and I don't know how, how, how many other types of coaching, business coaching, things like that. Um, sports psychology, you know, is very similar to performance psychology. It's just when I was choosing my master's, I wanted it to be performance because Sports psychology, when you say sports psychology, people usually say, oh, well, it's athletes, you know, but I wanted to work. I was, I'm so, you know, in love with aviation, all my, my family, everyone's a pilot, grandparents, both grandma, grandpa, uncles, my dad, my brother, my mom was a flight attendant. <laughs> so I grew up and, you know, even though I was a swimmer, I grew up every day talking about aviation. 
My dad is an examiner. He works for Boeing. So, you know, he does simulator, sim simulator training with pilots. And every single day I would hear about, you know, performance context and how pilots choke under stress when my dad's evaluating them in the back or giving them engine failure and all sorts of things. Um, so for me, I wanted to do performance because I knew I was gonna work with pilots. And, you know, as a sports psychologist, you can say like, oh, you know, yeah, you know, I, I'm a sports psychologist, but I can work with you. You know, when you say, when you come from a field of performance, it's in my master's uh, um, class, we had ballet dancers. We had people from the SWAT team, um, surfers, um, firefighters. So it was just a whole field of, you know, and athletes and, and business people. And so perf field of performance is really everything every single day. I mean, a performance is when you go to a job interview and you want to nail it in the sense that you're kind of ma maintaining some sort of emotional stability, that you're just yourself, that you can talk freely, remember what you wanted to say. I mean, it's all a mental state, right? You have to be in a certain mental state to be your best in that moment. And, you know, it could be a job interview. It could be a date <laughs> with the love of your life and you completely like choke and freeze. No, I'm joking, but, um, you know, performance is everywhere and, and we all perform it or some go on stage and they talk and some other people, um, just want to be they want to learn how to be more focused so that they can be more productive and efficient right the ability to train focus is very important um some people you know i don't know tennis players also uh you know use a lot of visualization skills so you want to i mean it's it's a lot of sports psychology of course but uh translated into the performance field if you know what i mean so it's not just typical athletes but it's every human who needs to just be mentally resilient in everyday life because we all go through challenges every single day. So if I understand correctly, you could say that performance psychology is a sports psychology for everyday men. <laughs> sure, for all of us. Yeah, for all of us. Uh, yeah. if, you, if you simply it down. Yeah. Uh, I would like to ask you, you gave us really a broad view what uh, performance psychology is. But I can't help but wonder, how were your first days as a, sport, uh, as a performance psychologist? How did you experience the transition from studying into the performance here? Guys, this is how I started. Honestly, like what I would do, luckily I'm a credible human in the swimming world, right? <laughs> so I said, where should I start? <laughs> uh, by the way, I started, I started with pilots. I did because I was so knowledge knowledgeable about aviation. And I started, I moved after I did my master's, I moved to Dubai, back to, back to Dubai. It's, you know, I spent there six years when I was a young child. And then I spent another three years in Dubai between the US and, um, and then I moved to Norway. But um, I, I signed up for an inter internship at Emirates Airlines psychology department. And that's where I developed my mental resilience training program for pilots. And I was in the office just typing, you know, my whole mindfulness training program specifically ta tailored to pilots. And then I would have some one-on-one -on -one sessions with pilots who would fail simulator exams. And I felt like really, I felt credible. I was doing really well, but you know, I still, mm, I mean, I had to really build my experience with all that knowledge I had to put it into practice and really know how to communicate the knowledge. So then I was like, okay, you know, this is a field that I'm still working on, but I know swimmers so well. I just know every single thought. I know every single emotion. I know, you know, everything. So I just came to a club in Dubai and I was like, can I work with you guys? And it was kids from 12 years of age to around 20. You know, it was just like, I had a few, I had different groups. And I would literally write out material and I would give them, be like, oh, here's one PDF for today. And I would just give out papers to kids sitting on the floor at a swimming pool. And I would tell them about mindful, mindful breathing and awareness of thoughts and body scans. And we did, we did lots and lots of different things, you know, overcoming fear and, and learning how to manage expectations and pressure. And so 
the whole thing that you know I, I wanted to just test out, <laughs> they were my test bunnies. But somehow the kids believed me and I was very relaxed. I didn't have to prove anything to anyone. I started with 12 year old kids. And then I slowly built my experiences. And after Dubai, I moved to Norway. I worked for one year for free. I, most of this time, this, all this, I worked for free. I don't know why, but you know, I, sh I shouldn't have. Eventually my brother was like, you should charge for this. <laughs> so yeah, I later learned how, learned how to charge as well. That was the part that I had to learn. But I worked in Norway. I just wanted to share this experience. Um, I went to work for a startup company that was combining it was an app that combines mental and physical training. And I was in charge of the whole mental training program. And that's really when I started thinking about how do I put, you know, how do I structure my material into actual training programs? And I had experiences from pilots and Emirates as well. And then I also prepared uh, four girls. I worked with them for six months uh, to row across the Atlantic. So they rode, rode from Canary Islands to Antigua. 5,000 kilometers. Whoa. Yeah, so that was cool because then, you know, I really took it seriously. I was like, these, these women are rowing across the Atlantic. <laughs> and I had to step up my game. And that's really when I was like, okay, you know, now I really know what I'm talking about. I'm very, and I, I filmed over 100 different meditation recordings for them to take on the boat because they had to learn how to fall asleep in less than two minutes, uh, breathe. I mean, it was just, I even recorded Merry Christmas for them and like all these Aww. different things. <laughs> yeah, or happy birthdays when somebody had a birthday. So I was kind of like their, you know, a uh, guiding spirit on the boat when they were on the boat for more than 36 days. Uh, rowing two hours, two hours resting. Two hours rowing, two hours resting for 36 days nonstop. So the, the, it was more than just being a psychologist. It was also being a bit of a friend. And a... Yeah, 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 I was. Yeah. So, you know, I just, not like, I know I'm talking a lot, but I just wanted to tell you how, how it was really a progression, you know, from one to another. And then I moved to Slovenia because it, the, the startup completely failed. And my bosses started living in tents in the middle of a forest. And they would come to my house to shower. And I was like, okay, I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> I'm leaving. And then I came home and I was like, okay, I need to do something for swimmers. So then I just sat down and I typed all my material into a mental training manual for swimmers. Um, because I knew I just had to have everything in, you know, one, in just like one package. And that was my next project. And then I meet the love of my life here in Slovenia. And then he told me all of a sudden, now you need to, you know, bring all this knowledge to Slovenia. And it took me more than half a year to learn how to lecture in Slovenian. So the first few lectures in Slovenia, I was like, I apologize. I know I'm Slovenian, but I'm going to lecture in English. And people were so nice. They were like, sure. Um, and then that's how it all ended. I ended up in Slovenia. Uh, companies were calling me in and the more I worked, which is now the last four years, the more I was able to restructure my content, learn from my clients, uh, see what they need. Um, and now I'm just in it a million percent and helping people develop resilient mindsets. Yeah. You mentioned the book that you wrote, but uh, just last week I was walking around uh, Brigitte and I passed the bookstore and I happened to see your poster and underneath was a board game that you also developed. Uh, what about that? How, how did you as a psychologist uh, came up with the idea of making a board game? And what yeah, board game so did you tell us about it? Thank you, so sweet. I didn't, I didn't come here to like commercialize my products, but I just wanna, I wanna share what's, <laughs> what's possible, <laughs> like what you can do with, with you know, here, yeah, I, I, this is the English version, play to make it happen. It's a board game that looks like this. Um, what the idea behind this is, as soon as I started working with lots of different profiles and not just performers, but let's say, you know, just people working in companies and not really being from these, you know, high expectation, like fields of, you know, I wanna be the best or, 
you know, people that know what they're after, they're driven. And they also understand that if they want to achieve something, they need to set a goal. Majority of people, honestly, majority, like I'm talking 98% of people don't know how to set goals. They, well, okay. Lately, it's an excuse because you could just Google it or buy a book or, you know, I don't know, get a workshop or something. But they're just so not familiar with the process of goal setting or they're scared of it or they try to set a goal and they fail. They're like, mm, no point in trying again. Uh, some people are just passive about their life. They're like, tomorrow, you know, it's going to happen tomorrow, maybe Friday. You know, today my aunt just baked a pie. So let me just eat all this pie. And then Monday. Monday is the day when I really start or next year and that, I don't know, what other year. And I just saw so much potential in this field, not because, you know, just goal setting sounds like, oh, you know, now everybody has to be successful and fit and whatever, rich and yeah, that's not the point. The point of goal setting is simply if you want to achieve whatever it is that you want to achieve. If you have some sort of wish and if you want to realize it, you have to make a plan, right? You have to, you have to, I mean, every, everybody knows this in our field of psychology is that, you know, I have to now make this big goal into sub goals and then kind of plan out my daily action goals. Like what are the things I can do daily to help me move closer to my goal? Um, you know, that's one thing, like really knowing how to plan it out. Um, and yeah, people, you know, don't really do that either. Um, basically, so, but that's just one step of the, you know, 10 different kind of steps that I put in, in, inside this box. What I wanted people to learn is not only how to set a goal, but also wire your brain for success. So in here is, yeah, and it's all, you know, scientifically proven methods. I didn't come up with anything. I added a little bit of my spice. But I, I really, for two years, I've studied all the goal setting literature out on, on this entire planet from New Zealand to, you know, Japan, and I ordered ev everything. And then I said, why don't we put this topic, you know, this skill, it's like a life skill into a form of a board game so that people no longer have excuses. I don't want to read a book. I don't want to go to a lecture. I don't want to do this or goal setting is boring. So I wanted to, you know, spice it up and make it like a very fun board game. And it really includes all the necessary steps needed to set a goal and also achieve it. So it's setting goal, for example, is um, I said, okay, like planning out your action steps, but then it's about finding your why. It's about, um, you know, picking your support system. It's about, uh, and then, you know, uh, find like and then it's all the mental aspects it mostly focuses on the mental aspects of how to go about achieving your goal from acquiring belief systems that you need uh, values um, a mindful a mindful um, a mindful attitude when it comes to you know how how you're aware of your thoughts every single day um, uh, visualizing skills tracking progress yeah, so I wanted, I, that's, the, that's how the idea came up. And I was like, let's make this into a board game. And my, my future husband, my, my, I don't know, my fiance, my partner, um, develops business gifts. And, you know, he told me, Sarah, why don't we turn this topic into a box, like an actual physical, physical box so that people can buy it or businesses can buy it. Anyone, I mean, it's 13 plus. Um, I believe that any, you know, younger athlete who, uh, athlete or, mm, yeah, teenager who, who knows what they want, like they, they can acquire these skills as early as that, but it's up to a hundred years. So it's like quite a span. Um, and I, I genuinely believe that if people have this tool in their house, they're going to live more purpose-driven lives because it is, as soon as you set a goal, at least you know where you're going and you know you, you know that you can be less distracted by other things and you know how valuable our attention is and how quickly somebody takes attention away from us if i know what my plan is where i'm headed what are the daily things i need to do to get there if i know my reason 
why am, why am I doing this? Why is this important to me? How is it going to impact me as a human if I achieve this goal? If I have my beliefs and values in place, I honestly live like a life that I get to choose. And unfortunately, I just saw just people being miserable and waiting to be a little bit more f- fulfilled and not doing anything about it. So that was like, let's do instead of waking up themselves. Sorry, what? W- waiting to be woken up instead of waking up themselves. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it's okay. We need to put. We need to help them because you know I don't judge them. They came from the certain environment that they came from, and they don't even know different. Yeah, for what you were talking about this board game, the reason I brought it up is I'm going to be honest, I'm a re- I have a really playful personality. And when I saw a board game uh, connected to psychology, I, I just laughed to myself. I was like, oh, this is a crazy idea. Usually I'm used to those monotone books sitting at home, reading through the pages, trying to learn something. And I was like, yeah, this is actually fun. Uh, this is something different. And uh, what you were describing right now, I couldn't have to go back to when you were talking about performance psychology, when I kind of uh, uh, simpled it down to a uh, sports psychology for everyday men. Uh, I think this board game kind of impersonalizes that. It's performance is psychology for everyone. For, uh, just as you mentioned, for people who, who do not feel like reading books, who maybe just want to do something a bit more in their leisure time and have fun while trying to reach that something more, uh, not selling for what they have, but uh, working towards something more. And I don't know. Uh, Psychology I- should be fun, shouldn't it? I feel like that's, that's the direction we need to be going. It's like, okay, let's learn the theories, everybody. Let's learn about all the beautiful big men of psychology and understand the theories. That's perfect. But what we need to start working really, really on as a field is how do you bring this knowledge to people? How do you, how do, how do I package, you know, the skill set and tell you if you do this every single day, you're gonna be not like just a better human in general and sure more successful, but you're gonna be so much healthier. Because, because I mean, we, you know, especially today's young generations that are obsessed with body image and how they're supposed to look like and I don't know who's really like growing into, you know, a healthy, resilient individual if you don't build that awareness around it. If you don't have a, if you don't have a parent who guides you into a more healthy direction. And then there's just a lot of pressure and anxiety. And, you know, unfortunately kids with depression and, um, you know, this, this hopeless behavior, maybe they're overloaded with, with the work, yeah, with workload in school and, and, you know, so you just, you need, you need skills and tools that help you every single day. I mean, how do, how do I train focus? There's exercises how to train focus. Of course, I can do it through a meditation exercise, you know, really pay attention to my breathing, learn how my awareness immediately travels somewhere else. And I learn how to bring it back and I catch myself again I'm not here right, right here right now. I bring my awareness back to the breath. Again, my mind wonders. Again, I say, okay, I'm not right here. My mind has wondered. I bring the attention back, right? But there's different daily exercises how to train focus. But you need to be conscious. You need to train awareness so that you realize, oh, wow, you know, I'm picking up my phone again. Oh, I'm picking up my phone again. Maybe I should put it into a different <laughs> room. You know, um, consciously paying attention to how you talk to yourself every single day. How do I talk to myself? What is my inner dialogue like? What's my monologue? How, what are the stories that I'm telling myself about what happened, about what's going to happen? Do I, can I, can I actually be present? Do I know how to regulate my nervous system? Do I, you know, am I breathing with my, with my tummy? Am I, you know, breathing in my diaphragm? just so that I activate the vagus nerve, which consequently, you know, activates my parasympathetic nervous system so that my body can be calmer and more relaxed so that I'm not holding tension. Why am I, you know, clenching my jaw while typing an essay? I mean, you know, all these different little things. Do I know how to interpret my emotions in the right way? 
Am I aware of my body posture? You know, or uh, do I know how to develop a, a healthier attitude in life of self-care? Do how what's my the relationship with myself like? Do I, you know, how do I how do I build confidence? Sure, through you know getting more competent in what I do and acquiring the abilities, um, the time and the effort that let's say I described to you, you know, how <laughs> how I got better at my job. But what is really confidence? You know, people need tools. How, how, do, how can I be confident regardless of all this you know, experience and competence that I'm experiencing? I mean, my confidence, for example, was at zero. The first time I came to Slovenia, well, okay, the first lecture I had in Slovenian. Oh my God, I was like, dear universe, whatever is out there, please help me. Um, but then you know what I did? I just came in front of those hundred people and I said, guys, this is the first time I, I'm lecturing in Slovenian. Would, will you help me if I don't remember a word? And they were like, yeah, of course, right? So confidence is then learning about how do you, how do you just feel good in your own skin? How, how can I feel comfortable with who I am? You know, cherish myself, value myself, feel like I am enough. These are, you know, this is what it's all about, right? We need to, these are the things we need to talk about. And that's why psychology should be practical and fun. And sure, with some basis of neuroscience so that you understand how your brain works under stress. And what is it that you're training when you're training mindfulness skills through meditation? And how does meditation impact your cognitive functioning? And, you know, all the executive functioning of the prefrontal cortex. Um, how does it impact... Uh, your amygdala and your emo you know, also emotional headquarters. And right, so it's, it's for me, it's how, how do we get this knowledge out there? And like you said, whether it's a board game, just to familiar, familiarize, familiarize people with the process and say, listen, it's not that difficult. You just have to sit down with yourself and plan out your future. Anyways, I don't want to sound like a priest talking in a church. <laughs> you know, I just wanted to tell you guys, like, this is, this is the essence of psychology that we should really be addressing. And without, like, yes, focus on the theories for one day. Next day, let's focus on how do we bring this skill to every single kindergarten, every single first, second, third grade, all the way to eighth grade, ninth grade now in Slovenia. So that when they come to high school, they're ready for life. Why, why do we have so many unhappy young people right now? It's just, it just breaks my heart. And then, and then we don't have enough psychologists and people calling me every single day. My son, my daughter, my this, my that. I, I, I couldn't help but uh, to relate with what you were saying right now. Because just this year, I started uh, lecturing in some primary schools about mental health. And I remember in October, I had my first lecture, but how it ended up happening, I was supposed to go there to uh, observe another psychologist do it. I woke up at uh, 6.30 uh, to an SMS message saying uh, the lecturer got sick, can you take over? Uh, I, I was nervous as hell. Uh, didn't have anything prepared, no PowerPoint. It was a five hour lecture. Uh, I came in front of a classroom of uh, eighth graders. I looked at them probably with fear in my eyes and I told them, guys, I'm going to be honest. I have no idea what we're supposed to do today. I have some PowerPoints that I just got five minutes er uh, ago. Let's just spend these five hours in a productive way. Tell me what you want to know and let's explore the field that you want to talk about. And wow. again, I, I really relate with what you were saying regarding make psychology fun, make it in a way that people want to learn about it when it becomes uh, something interesting, not something monotone with a lot of numbers and uh, years that you have to remember and theories that overlap uh, one another. Just make it a bit more practical. Yeah, but the, uh, definitely. And it's the, the, the most ironic thing is like we think, oh, psychology, all this. Oh, wow. Psycholo psychology is right here and my body's right here every single day, all day from the moment I wake up from them to the moment I fall asleep. The way I perceive the situation, the way I talk about it, you know, the way I talk about it to my husband when I come home. 
the way I talk to him is psychology. How do I communicate? Am I a mindful communicator? Do I just like burst out my emotions because I feel frustrated onto him? Or do I, you know, breathe, center myself and, you know, choose the right words to communicate what it is I want or ask for what I need, right? It's there every single day, all day with us. I mean, there's no, it's this right here directs this right here <laughs> and vice versa, you know? So we need to make it like, yeah, exactly like you said, you know? And, and I'm so glad for you that you approach the situation that way because when you make it cool and just, you just neutralize the stress and you say, listen, this is, this is what it is. But you know, what, what I've been noticing, uh, especially in Slovenia, as much as I love it, is people just, just constantly have this uh, idea that they need to pretend to be someone. <laughs> so, I mean, pretend more like, I now need to look so professional and I need to sound so eloquent. And, uh, you know, everything that I studied now, I need to say through these PowerPoints because everybody looks at the PowerPoints and the 10,000 words that are on this PowerPoint. No one gives a shit about any of that written on the PowerPoint. People just want to hear your story. People want to hear, you know, some practical tool, something that you went through that could help them. I have a six hour lecture. You know what they remember most? They remember how I visualized my Olympic medal. They remember you know, the thoughts that I had in my mind before I was jumping into the pool every day. They, sure, they, re they remember very powerful mindfulness, mindfulness exercises or the last 20 minutes, I put them in a state of hypnosis and I just put some, you know, positive information in there. They're like, oh, I feel so good. Um, you know, so that's what they remember. They don't remember, I mean, when if the statistic, it's an actual science study done is through psychology that the majority of people only remember 20% of what you've been discussing. So let's say we finish this call, you know, <laughs> in half an hour, most of the people on this call, I know, thank you guys so much for listening to me. It really means a lot, but what, I don't know what you will remember. Maybe you will just feel good. Be like, oh, that was a fun session. What did I actually learn? not sure <laughs> but people <laughs> may, you know if you if I will maybe share some of my stories you know with psychology I can do that's what you're gonna remember so that you know that, that's kind of those are the kind of people you need in the fields of psychology that just come there with a genuine heart um, tell the story the real story like what is the struggle we all go through the same struggle now how do we help one another? These are my skills. I can share them with you. Why don't you try it? We all have the same brain. It's malleable. It's plastic. It can change no matter how old you are. Try it. Try meditating for three months. You will notice the difference. On, on the topic of retention, uh, I always tell myself, especially when working with kids, they're not going to remember what you tell them, but they're going to remember how they felt. Uh, when they were working with you. Yeah. So I think that's one of the uh, ideas that, sh in my opinion, should be towards when we talk about psychology and pre presenting it to common folk, common folk with uh, quote, quotation marks. Yeah, but it's the same with professors, no? Which professor yeah, or teacher in school do you remember most? It's the teacher that really loved you and cared for you and just showed up with good energy every day. Oh, Sara, you keep mentioning tools and like approaches, and I'm wondering how these tools differ when you work for, let's say, with pilots or like with professional athletes or like magicians. Do you uh, use different tools, tools. or like okay. approaches? Approach yeah, approaches are, you know, very much the same. So. Let's say when I start working with, in, with an individual, honestly, whether it's a pilot or whether it's a athlete or a dancer, the first thing we, we covered the basics. So let's say um, my, my job, the first thing is to help them build a strong foundation of mindfulness skills. I need to level up their awareness because the more conscious they are, the more awake, the more they can recognize what is happening within their mind and body, the easier they're able to 
deal with stress that happens, right? So what I would do, the first like really basic things, usually people don't even you know, think about it, but it's breathing. It's mindful breathing, really learning how to, so right, I started with diaphragmic breathing because you know, usually people, you know, these are performers that even, you don't even have to be in a stressful performance. Let's say something's going on with the, you know, in the cockpit and there's a problem or a dancer is just about to enter the stage, but it's, you know, as soon as they wake up, maybe on the car, on the way to practice, you know, there's a huge traffic jam and they're late and they're getting tight and, um, you know, they're, they're just like all anxious, like, oh, I'm going to be late for practice. Okay, how do I center myself? How in any moment, if I'm late, waiting in line at the post office, I get frustrated because it's just such a long line. How do I call my, how do I call my body? How do I help myself just physically and mentally first regulate is through breathing, right? So we would really cover importance of breath awareness, diaphragmic breathing. There's different exercises. I do box breathing a lot with all, all perform performers. Um, we train focus through breathing. Focus meaning, like I mentioned before, is that when I close my eyes, I have better interoceptive awareness. So, you know, focusing on the breath, I can also better notice how my mind wanders, that my attention has gone away from the breath and I need to learn how to bring it back, right? So we do attention training through breathing. Um, we do... What else do we do in breath work? I mean, with athletes is a little bit different. Sometimes we do like explosive breathing just so that, um, you know, maybe a tennis player just before they need to like hit that ace, you know, you need to connect your, your, your body, like you need to connect your body and, and activate your core so that you feel powerful and strong or a swimmer before they get on the blocks to sprint. Um, I mean, lots and lots of different breathing um, uh, exercises, but it's, Am I paying attention to my breath? Majority of people say no. Athletes, maybe a little bit more. Swimmers, yeah. You know, because we would, we need to breathe in the water, otherwise we'd drown. <laughs> um, um, so that's really the foundation. It's all about conscious breathing. And the best mindfulness training exercise for me, you know, apart from the daily mindfulness that you can be aware how you take a sip of water, that you chew your food more mindfully, notice under the shower, just paying attention, bringing awareness to the present moment and, you know, being right here right now with whatever it is that you're doing. That is super, super powerful training because we can only be efficient. We can only feel good if we're in this moment right here, right now, right? So all those different kinds of benefits, whether it's daily mindfulness, um, awareness of breath, mostly, mostly, mostly whether to bring attention back into the right here, right now, or regulate your nervous system. Um, you know, so powerful. And then, and then because I, I need them to develop these steps, right? So breath awareness, the second is thought awareness. You cannot think about any sort of optimal performance if you don't know how to regulate your thoughts or develop a new relationship with your thoughts. And say, uh huh, interesting, you know, on the way to work right now as a pilot, I just had a fight with my wife. My kids aren't listening to me. I have a flight to Kathmandu, which is such a difficult airport. The weather is shitty, you know. I have a, you know, co pilot that's also not my favorite, you know, maybe you know the person, I don't know, <laughs> right? So, how do I, how do I let all that mental drama that's accumulating right here? How do I just simply let it pass, right? And just observe my thoughts and not get involved with them um, so that I can stay emotionally more calm and stable. Um, what kind of words do I tell myself when, for example, before a challenge? You know, it's, it is the cheesy encourage, self-encouraging, but you need to constantly tell. Like I, for example, even though in the morning I would pray that my coach slept through the alarm, I was like, please. <laughs> Just don't appear in practice. <laughs> but he was always there. But the second option was there was no water in the pool. I was like, somehow magically the water disappeared. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure the, the water was also always there, right? So even though I'm kind of like there, I'm telling myself every single morning, I wake up to an alarm clock, the world's greatest by R. Kelly. 
all the, all the time, like I'm sleepy. I can't like even brush my teeth in the morning. I get in the car. I tell myself all 10 minutes on the way to practice, I'm an Olympic champion. I'm an Olympic champion. I'm an Olympic champion. I believe in myself. Um, I can do this. Let's go. Come on. Like, you know, how, like you both know, like when you're going through physical pain and I swam 16 kilometers a day and I couldn't even touch the floor. Like it wasn't like, oh, let me rest. Oh, I just need to rest. No, it was keeping my body on top of the water for 16 kilometers a day. Okay, there's a little bit of rest on the wall, but it's usually when a coach is telling you the set and you're thinking, oh my God, I'm going to die. Um, right? So it's this constant battle in your mind and you have to develop thought awareness through mindfulness, through thought, like mind, mindful thought awareness practices so that I can develop a better relationship with these crazy thoughts and that they, I get to choose how I want to respond, how I want to view this challenge. Instead of saying, I'm going to die. This is way too much. This is too little rest. Are you crazy? You don't even know how hard yesterday was. I'm already in so much pain. I can't lift my arms. This is unfair. Is it over yet? Come on. Right? I need to, I need to use different kinds of words. I need to create a different kind of reality for myself. And yes, I need to lie to myself sometimes because the brain doesn't know the difference between what is true and what is not true. So I need to tell myself, you know, not, you know, this is too hard, I'm gonna die. This is challenging. Yes, this is gonna require some time and effort. What's my best coping strategy? How am I gonna manage this, right? So learning how to question, how to bring about questions that help you look for solutions. Like, how am I gonna do this? I can do this by focusing on this, 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 and this, right? So finding my solutions. How am I going to survive this challenge? But you cannot do this without, you know, not paying attention to what it is you're saying. I'm a failure. I'm stupid. I'm dumb. I'm fat. This is not meant for me. It's my genes. Every single belief I have about myself manifests into some sort of action. If I tell myself, I'm so lazy. I'm so lazy today. It's raining. I'm just going to, you know, sit and watch Netflix. The brain doesn't go, come on, come on, Aide, Benjamin, come on, let's go. What are, you talk, what are you saying to yourself? It just goes, sure, let's put your legs up. Let's put your legs up and watch some Netflix, right? It follows your command. So whatever it is that you tell yourself, be responsible for what, whatever it, you know, happens. I'm lazy, I can't do this. And then your mind immediately, you know, will go, you know, start vacuuming or doing laundry and folding socks because you didn't want to type the essay. You just told yourself you don't want to type the essay. So let's, let's look for something else. And you're always going to maybe go to the fridge and get some, you know, something to do. And, and today you just have your phone. So you're like, let me just scroll a little more. Right? So whenever we are, why thought awareness is so important? Because whenever you're faced with a challenge, <clears throat> Uh, the natural instinct of the mind is, you know, that challenge is unfamiliar, it's unknown. And the, the, the role, the main function of the brain is to keep you safe, you know, in a comf comfortable, familiar space. So of course, when a challenge in front of you, this long essay is super unfamiliar, of course, you're running away from it is because, you know, because, yeah, it's not comfortable. But then you need to tell yourself, this is just an essay. I can do this one step at a time. How can I start writing for 10 minutes? Let me just start writing for 10 minutes. Even if it's, if it's crap, like, let me just start, right? If I just tell myself, oh, but I don't have time right now. And then you have time to fold your socks. So, you know, this, the, the whole idea behind thought awareness is so powerful because every single word you say it's just, it manifests into some sort of reality. Whether yourself, like if I tell myself, I mean, if I have a very poor self-talk and I know it sounds cheesy, but I mean, the, you know, you have to talk to yourself in a confident way because people, listen to how confident people talk. Confident people don't say, well, you know, I mean, I prepared, you know, but I'm not really sure if I can do it. I mean, maybe I'll forget. No, confident people say, you know what? I'm ready. 
I put in the time and effort and my mind is brilliant. I'm gonna remember everything that I put down on that paper. And you give yourself positively directed commands focused on what you want to happen, right? So instead of, oh, I hope I don't fall or crash or you know miss this line. But again, this all starts with making these goals, right? Yeah. Well, exactly, right? So you know, preparing, what? making a plan, making goals, preparing, structuring. Yeah, well, you need to you need to make, I mean, of course, the structuring, the planning of goals, but as you're there in that moment, you need to really figure out how you're talking to yourself because if you're giving yourself negative commands, that's what's gonna happen. It's like a parent saying, Don't fall, like like in Slovenia, it's all done bush. Like, don't fall, don't slip, don't spill, don't get sick. You're or actually they don't even say don't get sick. They're like, you're gonna get sick. You're you're not, you know, you're not wearing enough clothes, you're gonna get sick. I'm like, what kind of you know a command is this? You're gonna get sick. You know, put on some work clothes, dress up a little warmer so that you stay healthy. Why don't you step slowly and carefully and more confidently so that you stay safe? Not, oh my God, you're going to fall. I can already see it. You're going to kill yourself. You know, that's how psychology works. So thought awareness is so, so important. Or, or even worse, you know, people dramatize. They say, this traffic, this traffic is killing me. Nobody knows how to drive. I'm going to move towns because this is crazy. I mean, which, who, which traffic is killing you? It's not killing you. It's like, yeah, this, it's tra there's traffic. Why don't we just neutralize the situation? There's traffic. I'm going to have to wait a little longer. Not, oh, my headache, my headache. I'm just going to die. My head's going to explode. This is unreal. Like, this is unbearable pain. <laughs> the words people use are so dramatic. I just focusing on negative things, right? Instead of like focusing on the things that we can do. Yes. At that moment. Yes. But the funny thing is people are not aware of this, right? So building that foundation step by step, then we develop body awareness because you need to be the master of your body in the sense of, you know, what is my facial expression like in the water? Am I like squeezing my face and barely breathing? In tennis, like what, I mean, what, you know, maybe I'm holding tension in my, in my fist, in my fingers. I need to be aware so that I can loosen it up. You know, body awareness, using imagination. How do I help my body move by pretending? In, you know, with swimmers, I work with a lot of pretend play. I used to pretend wa water was thick like Nutella. And I would tell myself, water is thick like Nutella. Water is thick like Nutella so that I would have like a little bit more surface to push on and, and cover more distance per stroke, right? And then you go into attitude and you develop this kind of, you know, responsibility for your actions. And then we talk a lot about visualizing skills because, so it's a whole program that I go through them no matter, I mean, it's tailored to every performer, but they need to have a foundation of mindfulness training and visualizing skills. So that visualizing so that they can pre uh, prepare for a performance ahead of time, right? Um, so regardless of the field, I want to make my performance for performers more mindful. That's number one. And when we train that awareness and when they, they have these aha moments, then we can start unraveling like, you know, okay, you know, where am I headed in life? What it is I want? How do I maybe build my confidence even more. Um, and then it's just like a little bit of fine tuning, nothing more. But for me, the, the essence is in training your brain through awareness training. That's what builds resilience. From there, I mean, you can achieve whatever it is you want. For what you were describing, uh, I would just like to ask uh, first of all the question, when you were talking about the thoughts and how you go uh, at sports, for instance, uh, I'm an acrobat and I know for myself, when I'm lazy on my trainings, I would just like to do those safe jumps that I know how to do. Let's say a double flip, I could say, I would just do two hours of that, have my happy moments, everything is fine. And then my training trainer comes and he says, okay, today you're gonna train triple flips. At that moment, I almost every time my mind goes, this guy is crazy. How the hell does he think that I'm gonna do a triple flip? 
I'm barely doing double tricks right now. But after uh, a minute or two, I say, okay, I, I guess if he says to me that I can do it, I probably can. And I know that I've been training double flips for long enough that I can do a triple flip. So I'm just going to trust his judgment and my body and I'm going to do it. Sure. Uh, so I would ask, we also maybe work uh, with uh, the relation between the coach and the uh, athlete, because I think that's a pivotal point for a uh, professional athlete, because you spend a lot of time together. Uh, of course, what you mentioned, building your uh, thought process and mindfulness, but what about the relationship? You also work with that. Yeah, of course, parents, coaches, and athletes, if they're younger. Unfortunately, sometimes I have, I mean, I have no control over the parents. So I'm like, I just need to make this child as resilient as possible uh, just to manage the parent. <laughs> 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 um, but I do work with coaches. Of course, they're notified. Um, they help me get a lot of insight as to, you know, what's going on in training. They, they know their athletes better. Sometimes I have an athlete who portrays to me, you know, as this, um, um, I don't know, this all, almighty athlete and that, you know, even though they came for me for help, they're like, I, I know it all. Yes, I know it all. And then they don't really, they, I'm like, okay, sure, you know, but, you know, let's start here and there. Um, so they give me a really good insight into the actual kid or, or performer. Um, you know, if it's a pilot and they're an adult, you know, I don't work with any other person. But if it's a younger one, definitely. Yeah, yeah. It's so important. Like they need to be um, informed. I don't, for example, share anything we do. Um, of course, it's confidential. If the child, if this athlete, whoever, you know, is still in that relationship with a coach um, wants to share what we did individually, sure. But if it's a collective thing, when, when I worked with a team in Dubai, all the coaches were there in the sessions. The coaches need to be there in the sessions so that they can say to athletes, oh, remember what Sarah was telling about, like blowing bubbles into the water and breathing and you know, let's take these 10 seconds to recollect and plan ahead, you know, what are our focus points, what are, what is our intention moving forward, so that they remind athletes in the water, because sometimes athletes are just so drained, they're just barely living, so you need a coach to remind them of what it is that we, we work together on, you know, but good point. Because yeah. uh, I also read research, uh, it was made on gymnasts, uh, regarding uh, results and what coach said about uh, their performance before the competition. And the um, findings were that what coach uh, predicted was more accurate than uh, previous competitions. So if coach said for a certain athlete, this one is going to perform well, and the other one won't perform that well, that prediction was more accurate than, let's say, two years of previous results on the uh, international competitions, which I find really interesting. Wow, thank you for sharing. I didn't know this. It makes sense because the coaches are very in tune with their athletes, um, you know, and they can probably pick up on their body language or their, you know, state of mind that day. Um, they have this, like, sometimes, you know, we, it, there, there is such a thing as that this gut feeling, as this intuition. And when you have when you just feel that from an athlete, yeah, a coach can also, you know, feel that confidence in, in themselves that they got the athlete prepared and the athlete because they radiate this confidence. So it makes sense, but thank you for sharing. Um, Sarah, maybe a more personal kind of question, but I don't think too much. Um, what are the strategy, strategies that you use to turn off your professional life? Um, maybe the so-called work-life balance yeah where yeah. does the performance psychology fit in here yeah I mean I still I still sometimes struggle with that because I get I don't know I mean I I keep my relationships very professional but when I have young athletes I just feel like they're my kids I'm like oh and I'm thinking what <laughs> sometimes I think at night, I'm like, what else can I say or do or what kind of exercise can they can I send them? And sometimes I would send messages, you know, in the morning because I know they have a I actually just sent an athlete this morning. I'll share with you what I if you want. Like these are the things I think about when I work with athletes individually. Uh, I work I work actually with a tennis player. <laughs> and I told her I was like, 
you know, this is an important match. And if you have any kind of fears holding you back today, just, you know, write them on the toilet paper and then just flush it down the toilet, flush that fear down the toilet because I wrote to her because there's only two kinds of fears that we're born with. And one is fear of loud, loud sounds and one is fear of falling. And all the other fears are simply a construct of the mind. They don't exist. Um, and I told her, you know, that's, that's exercise number one. <laughs> exercise number two, if you get really caught up in your head, you know, just super worried if a point doesn't go well or, you know, the back end, forehand, whatever. You're just mad because you're like, this isn't working, the strategy that I came up with today. <laughs> I want, I told her, just zoom out your vision and know that you're on this beautiful green planet called the earth. And this tiny little planet is the, the tiniest, tiniest little dot in this ever most expansive, endless universe. So if you get caught up in your head, just remember that. So those are the things I would tell my athletes, you know, uh, I, or, you know, just millions of different things like this. And I have to say that I really struggle with um, completely turning off, but now as a mom, I don't have another choice. So um, my, my child deserves all my love and attention. And it's much easier now that as a mom, I'm fully engaged in that role because I need to be, I need to put him to bed, I need to feed him. Um, today I'm so lucky my partner is putting him to bed I have the freedom of being with you <laughs> but yeah so being a mom helps me now completely switch off because because I need to leave you know there are, I don't call them problems it's just I, I like to be really engaged in my work and find more ways of how I can be better and that sometimes you know drains my energy even when I'm done working but it's easier. Now as a mom, it's much easier. I don't have any other choices. So, so you're kind of forced to develop the methods and separation between work and- uh... Yeah. Yeah, I have to say that um, <clears throat> I really, um, I mean, I feel good right now. I'm so grateful I feel good, but I was really struggling the past four months uh, with like a diagnosis actually of long COVID. So I paid the price of, you know, constantly taking care of someone, you know, being there for them. I gave birth a year and a half ago. So I also, you know, my entire maternity leave, I was creating this. Whoever, whichever girl out there is planning to be a mother one day, just, you know, listen to the other moms. And when, when the baby sleeps, you sleep. <laughs> so I paid the price a little bit, you know, being in this hard work ethic, uh, lifestyle my whole life and I genuinely like I don't push myself I really don't I, I don't overdo it but with a small little child I you know I wasn't aware of how much energy was really being drained for me and I was constantly available constantly available for everyone so that now now this you know I, I have my own mental practices of how I go about conserving my energy if something goes really emotional when someone's sharing super something emotional I, I get into a bubble I'm like this bubble is protecting me um, so I have some visual cues and things I do if a person is trying to drain my energy after a lecture be like oh my son you know this and that and people love to you know like yeah well of course they like to talk about themselves so like all of us, <laughs> but you know, they come and I'm just, I feel exhausted after a three hour lecture and there's someone just like not letting me go. And I just keep cutting. I just keep cutting this energy, you know, like cut, cut, cut. <laughs> so there's things I do now to take care of myself because it, I really need to. And, and, and especially all of us in the fields of working with people, I need to take care of myself first. So now I go for massages. I go for floating therapies. I highly recommend floating to those who haven't tried it. It's the fastest and most efficient way of meditation. Not even meditation. You completely like, you just become pure consciousness. It's really beautiful. So that, yeah, a lot of working out um, so that I sweat and refresh my brain. I meditate every single day. I love Marissa Peer. 
I'm the biggest fan of Marissa Peer. Um, that's why I also went into hypnotherapy. If you, have, if you don't know about Marissa Peer, um, I encourage you to Google her. I love her meditations and hypnos hypnosis sessions. Uh, so I do all that. <laughs> Thank, Thank you for sharing. sharing. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Sarah, if you would uh, allow me, I would also like to ask a question that was left in the chat from David. Yeah. Uh, he, he asked that through his experience, he feels the development of individual requires time and one to one collaboration. Do you have any ideas how to help general public on a larger scale to develop their capacity to, for performance? since there is a shortage, shortage of people who work in the field of psychology. Wait, what are some ideas to help general public on a larger scale? Aha, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, mm, I mean, that's my job right now is uh, to film, right now I'm in the process of doing as many online workshops. Here's the, here's the you know, so to get to the general public, like you really want to um, uh, get, useful quality content out there. Um, and I, I feel like I'm on that path right now because um, I, I have to say it's very challenging because as all of you know, you know, you need very good marketing to help you get out there. Some people have such crappy shitty material, sorry to say, but I don't know how they got qualified to work in the fields. Um, and I'm like, I get excited about this PDF and this course and then and then I'm just like, what is this? So they have amazing marketing, and they, but not such good material. So um, in the field of psychology, we need, you know, it's kind of like, <laughs> I would say, you know, people just like to share all this stupid stuff on social media. We need people to start sharing super useful content. Um, if, that, if those things get, you know, go viral, um, then, then, then we're good, especially on TikTok, especially on all those um, channels where young people are. But for me, for example, the most empowering thing would do to change the education system and, and put mandatory mindfulness training in schools. Yeah. Every country on the planet. Yeah. Thank you Someone's for the answer. Uh, like, I hope David got... Uh, the answer Where's was David so from cool. David. I mean, people can ask, you know, you can like you can unmute yourself and be like, if you're happy with the answer, I'm not sure. Maybe you have a different opinion. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I totally agree uh, that uh, it should be employed since um, since the childhood, since the primary school uh, for kids to be aware of themselves, um, the way they perceive the world, the way they grew up, because um, that really helps a person um, starting from a young age is much more easier than at a later age because during the environment and the development of the personality there were things that um, yeah affect people and if we start from the younger generations uh, then uh, it's short of an improvement every year through year out so yeah i totally agree with you i see the same thing uh, employing some classes and as um, subjects that are more um, involved in young person development um, yeah. in their where life uh, where I'm, I'm from slovenia oh, yeah sorry okay yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i was like okay no you sound you know i mean you know we all kind of when you speak english sound slavic i, I thought i was uh, maybe some other country oh, yeah cool okay let's work on it you can chat me or instagram me if you have ideas you know i try and i mean i <clears throat> hopefully get into the Olympic committee soon and hopefully get through the Olympic committee into schools. I know, I mean, I know politicians too. It's not like, you know, I can call, I can call up a few people. It's just getting into changing the system, which is really rigid here in Slovenia. Um, it will take a little bit of time, but, but luckily people are, are more open to this. Don't you agree? At least. Yeah. And um, yeah, we can chat up. I have some contacts that could be helpful. Uh, and yeah, I totally agree. Uh, it's the employment of this kind of thing, making aware people of this. Because I myself, I feel that in Slovenia is still a taboo. When we start talking about psychology, everybody is like, oh, nothing's wrong with me. 
nobody said something's wrong with you we're just saying everything is fine and i think from that point as you mentioned um don't do this because then this will happen i think that's the mentality mostly as i experienced through my life in slovenia don't do this because this will happen nothing is wrong everything is fine now just focus on the positives and on through the goals that you want to achieve yeah 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 but the funny thing is like I mean, luckily, I feel like I'm a good person or somehow, I don't know, maybe it's my, call, my calling to do this in Slovenia, but somehow I, people believe me. I'm like, I tell, I tell all the CEOs, big companies, I'm like, guys, 60 men, you know? I'm like, I work with Navy SEALs and Marines. They're huge, like three meters macho men, you know? They <laughs> did this exercise, so let's all do it, you know? <laughs> and because they're like, oh, now I'm going to cross my legs. Now I'm going to become a Buddhist monk and like have an out of body experience. I'm like, no, let's train focus. Let's train your awareness. Let's, you know, learn how to regulate your attention and you'll see how difficult it is. And then after two minutes, they open their eyes. They're like, oh, I couldn't be focused on my breath for more than 20 seconds. I'm like, there you go. That's brain training. And if you present it to them in the sense of, you know, this is how your brain works. And these are the exercises to, to do it then they're like, oh, I get it. I had, I had a group of, you know, 200 IT technicians, the biggest geeks on the planet. And they're like, oh, 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 oh psychology. <laughs> and then I asked them, I'm like, do you like feeling miserable or do you like feeling sort of, you know, content as best as possible? They're like, well, that's true. I'm like, does your wife ever piss you off? Every day. Okay, how does she piss you off less? Do your kids throw you off and you yell at them? Yes. Could you reconsider how you communicate? Yes. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, sadly, our time is slowly running out. Uh, and for the end, I would like to give you a, a bit of a challenge uh, and maybe ask you if you could uh, give some sort of a summary. What would you like uh, closing thought of today's lecture about performance psychology be like two, three sentences, maybe a bit more. Yeah, uh, so you're asking me to, in three sentences, describe what, what psychology means. What, to what, would, what would you like that we leave today's lecture about performance psychology with? Yeah. Uh, oh, well, okay. How to put it? I know it's challenging. <laughs> What I want you to, to really um, live, uh, leave with is this notion of, wow, there's so much more to explore. What is, what is in here? Like, what, how, how, do, how does my mind function? Is it helping me or is it sabotaging me on a daily basis? Can I explore my, my patterns? of beliefs that I have about myself, about the world, about people, women, men, money. Like what is, what are the things that are holding me back from being the truest version of myself? And just listening. And through listening and through meditation, you're able to find those answers. And soon enough, you just live your life with a little bit more ease. So tuning in, um, let's say just words, tuning in, listening to yourself, um, training, really diving into the training, whether it's, you know, different forms of meditation, I really propose visualizing. I mean, I visualized my Olympic medal 300 times before I even got to Beijing. And, you know, when it happened, I was like, oh, cool, this is cool. Okay. <laughs> and then a and then few years later, I was like, why don't I have a boyfriend? I was like, if I visualize my Olympic medal, I'm just visualizing, <laughs> I'll just start visualizing meeting the love of my life. I was like, hmm, this feels so nice. And I, you know, he appeared three months later. So I'm a huge fan of visualizing. There's a whole neuroscience behind it. Tuning in, training, medita med meditating, visualizing. Um, and, then, and then simply, um, I mean, my biggest, really biggest asset in life was always being comfortable with who I am because my dad my dad my entire life my mom she was you know was is super Slovenian disciplina, let's work hard everybody stay grounded 
stop dreaming, la 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 la. <laughs> my dad, my whole life was like, let's dream big. And every day he would, teach them, he would tell me, I believe in you, I believe in you, I believe in you. Everything is possible. Everything on this planet is possible and you can do it. You wanna win an Olympic medal? I'll congratulate you for your Olympic medal. And we start congratulating each other two years before it even happened. And my mom left the building. She's like Mensos Michal, like every day. <laughs> so basically, you know, also sticking to people that make you feel good about who you are and see potential in you and encourage you and give you compliments. And, and you accept those compliments and really build that self-worth and say, I'm worthy. I'm worthy of love, you know, financial freedom or success. I'm worthy of health. I'm worthy and I, I deserve it. And when you go through that with that mindset of, you know, learning about who you are, dwelling into the mental training, and then just letting yourself be just the way you are and building that confidence in that way. If you didn't hear that from your parents, give it to yourself. Um, that for me is psychology of, of living just a life that's as easy as it can be in the sense that that's not attainable, but at least it's easier. <laughs> and there's ups and downs and crying and yelling and all of that, but you bounce back a little faster and you appreciate little things and you're grateful for a few things in life every single day. I practice gratitude religiously. Um, so acquiring those, okay, tuning in, mental training, meditation, visualization, letting yourself be who you are so that you can really go after for, for what it is you want. And acquiring those little skills every day, you know? That was such a long answer. <laughs> I, I mean, that's for me that's secret like secret to living a, a comfortable life and then when somebody you know when someone approaches you and they're mean and they have a you know just remember that people you know they say they always say they they say hurt people hurt people so when you when you when you witness somebody that's not in their true essence and they're you know, frustrated and angry and, you know, just in this really strange character of envy and blah, 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 blah. have compassion for them because, you know, they don't have the skills that you do. So you don't have to get involved in that drama. That, that really helped me a lot. It took me a few years to realize that. Um, and if someone's being, you know, yelling at you, rude, calling you names, putting you down, just be like, wow, this guy has a lot of issues. Don't tell them that out loud. <laughs> Internally be like, this is interesting. Poor him. I'm sure this is quite a traumatic childhood. <laughs> Give him some Gabor Mate to listen to be like, maybe you need like a, <laughs> a lecture from him. Anyways, tune in, listen to yourself as deeply as possible. Do the mental training and then let yourself be who you are. Because um, when we tune in with re really who we really are, we find our way. Um, and if it's not necessarily immediately the right way, it's going to be the next corner. Um, and then with that, with that attitude, you keep growing, you keep learning. I learn every day, you know, I never, I feel like I'm, you know, I'm really, I call myself an expert in my field, but I, I know nothing yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm just I super grateful for everyone to spend your whole evening with me, listening to me talk so much. But hopefully, I don't know, we can stay in touch if anybody needs more concrete answers to something, um, if somehow I can help you out. Let I, me I ask. You mentioned that your final answer was long, but I didn't want to interrupt you exactly because it was something that resonated with, within me. And I think uh, other listeners also maybe felt it. Uh, and it's a closing thought that I think we can all take with us to, uh, to our home, to wherever we are right now and have something from this evening that we spent with you. And we would also like to thank you that you took time out of your day to present the field of performance psychology to all the SFU branches. And I, I, again, I would like to thank everybody that tuned in just the way Sarah said it, 
Uh, I hope that the hour and a half you spent with us was productive. You learned something new and maybe uh, got some new interest on the field. Uh, and like that, uh, just like David, David already mentioned, we will start building some new uh, psychologists that are interested in the field and maybe grow the community and help people in uh, different ways. Kvala, thank you so much. Yes, the whole point is that, uh, you know, um, that, that we do build this community. And I have to say that since I moved to Slovenia, I was so busy working that I kind of, you know, I'm not to say, but like I kind of lost that community vibe because I was so in my own world. And there's nothing more I'd like love to do that working on projects, learning from you guys. You have all this fresh knowledge. You know, I try and keep myself updated as best as possible. I love Andrew Huberman, his podcasts. Um, so I kind of learned from all of that. But, you know, you guys are young, fresh brains just straight out of Re uni or still in uni and <laughs> I would love to learn from you as well you know um, keep me you know keep in touch on insta I have my website as well um, <clears throat> I have this yeah board game I don't know I'll keep coming up with new products I'll have my workshop soon I'm, I'm now currently uh, working on develop filming a whole online workshop of, on goal setting and whatever is in here um, it's going to be, let's say, a three-hour at least workshop, and every single topic we're really going to dwell into it. Uh, so that's that. And then, you know, if you guys have any ideas, if, you know, I'm always willing to, uh, to hear what you have to say, and hopefully next time I join your, join your talks and learn from you. Uh, Thank you so much, Sarah, again. Yeah. Uh, I think on this note, uh, we will slowly conclude our uh, lecture. Um, Sarah, for those that haven't noticed, uh, left her Instagram in the chat. So if somebody wants to check it out, uh, just as she said, you're free to uh, contact her if I understood correctly, right? Yeah, contact me, write to me, whatever. I mean, um, right now I still use my Instagram for more, you know, personal purposes you'll see my child be like what is this i don't want to follow this <laughs> <laughs> but i wanna i want to turn my account also into one day hopefully one of those you know not those like you know uh, like cheesy psychology accounts every day like bombarding you with certain material but um just kind of like keeping the conversation going and if i have public lectures or if i have something you know think sharing things like that so thank you. Thanks again for organizing this. Big round of applause for the moderators. You did a really good job. I talk too much, but I maybe you learned a few things. You made a problem here. Good night. To everyone across the world, wherever you you know joined in, thank you. Thanks as well.